I've been asked many, many times to do a Mortal Kombat episode. I mean, I've worked Mortal Kombat elements into other episodes, and I did a bonus episode once fusing a bunch of Mortal Kombat characters, but I've never done a full, fleshed-out story episode for Mortal Kombat. So I got my subscribers to vote on what they wanted to see me do with Mortal Kombat characters, and based off that, in today's episode, I'm gonna do my best to try and merge the extremely extensive and wild lore of Mortal Kombat with the even more extensive lore of the Marvel Universe. I think I did a pretty fair job melding them together, but you can all decide for yourselves. So without further ado, let's get into Marvel Combat. Let's go. Hit like, if you want. Subscribe, if you feel like. But either way, enjoy the show. Time travel is not something that should be used on a whim. In fact, it's arguable that it should never be used at all for its ability to tear at the fabric of reality. Unfortunately, there are two realities in which the heroes and villains of those existences use it far too often to try and correct what they consider errors in the grand trajectory of their universes. In one of these realities, time has been meddled with by godly beings such as the Thunder God Raiden and the Titan Chronica, while in the other, Earth's Mightiest Heroes have used it to rewind disaster and even to fix universe-spanning genocide. But as these two universes used time travel more and more, they continued to break down the walls between their realities, and eventually an unexplainable anomaly occurred from their time travel exploits, which fused their universes together, bonding the consciousnesses of beings from each existence. It's been some time since this fusion, and I've been watching this merged universe for the last few decades as it's evolved. Allow me now to tell you the tales of some of the most interesting beings this fused reality has to offer. The first is a tyrant ruler, Thaukanos. He resides in Outelheim, a once dark and lawless dimension that he brought some semblance of order to. His goal became to merge all of the other realms of the universe with his own, to unify them under his own rule. He did so with many realms, but after winning over the worlds of Vanadenia, the Eternal Gods created a new multi-realm law that must be upheld before any assaults could be laid against another realm. They deemed to create a tournament that would have to be won multiple times by one specific realm in order for them to earn the right to invade another realm. But Kanos had no reason to agree to this tournament, until the Eternal Gods upped the stakes. Long had Kanos craved the power of the Infinity Gems, which could make their owner the most powerful being in the universe if they possessed all six. They'd long been hidden away by the Eternal Gods, but they agreed that for each consecutive victory of a Marvel Combat tournament, the winner's realm would be granted one of the six gems. If they won six in a row, they'd be rewarded the full set and be entitled to invade whichever realm they so chose but lose even one tournament before getting to six victories, and that realm would lose all of the gems that they'd acquired to that point. Still, it was an opportunity Kanos couldn't pass up, so he agreed. And thus, the Marvel Combat Tournament was made. Now, other realms had their share of heroes and fighters, but Kanos had no fear of losing. See, the Warlord had many warriors who could fight well for him in the tournament. He had his daughters, Katana Mora and Nebulina, who he'd adopted from realms he'd conquered. He ruthlessly trained them to be killing machines. Katana Mora's allegiance to her so-called father slipped more and more every year, but she'd still be an asset to him at least for a while. And then there was Thao Kanos' main weapon, Goro Obsidian an orange four-armed brute with near unmatched strength and brutality. Truly, Kanos' forces were ruthless and powerful, enough so to get him far closer to his next goals than anyone feared, getting all six gems and taking over Earthrealm. Now, Earthrealm had a very powerful protector in their god of thunder and lightning, Thoraiden. Unfortunately, he'd turn out to not be much help in the first tournaments. See, Thoraiden originally had little interest in fighting in Marvel Combat. He considered it a waste of time and assumed that no realm would be able to win six in a row. But he was goaded into entering the first tournament by his brother, Shinoki. Thoraiden was unaware that his brother was actually working for Thaukanos, as Shinoki regaled him with tales of how powerful Thaukanos' forces were, trying to belittle Thoraiden's own strength. 
Finally, the Thunder God fell for the taunts and agreed to enter the first tournament. Unfortunately for him, Shinoki had informed Kanos of all of his brother's weaknesses so that his own fighters could exploit them. Thuraden won many fights in the tournament, but by the time he got to Goro Obsidian, the four-armed brute, he was tired and worn from previous battles. Goro Obsidian managed to take Thuraden's own Thunderstaff and use it against him while holding the god in place with his spare arms. The so-called god was defeated and shamed as Eudelheim took the first win and Kanos accepted his reward of the first Infinity Gem. But Thuraden refused to accept this. He was arrogant and believed he'd only been bested because he was exhausted from the previous fights. A week later, after healing up, the Thunder God stormed into the kingdom of Eudelheim and attacked Thaukanos himself. He was able to beat the Overlord within an inch of his life, and could have likely ended the fight sooner if he'd gone for a blow to the head, but before he could finish his foe off, the Eternal Gods intervened. Thoradin's invasion, even though it had only been enacted by himself alone, was still in direct conflict with the rules of Marvel Combat. Thoradin's staff was taken from him, along with his godly abilities, save for his extended lifespan, and he was cast back to Earth. Shamed and weakened, the god hid away on Earth for the next generations, while Thaukanos' forces won tournament after tournament, getting ever closer to taking over Earthrealm. Now while there were those fighting in the tournament for the ultimate goal of protecting their realm, some were simply in it to settle scores. Logan Hasashi's reason for fighting reaches back before the first tournament ever began. He and his half-brother, Bihan Creed, had been trained as assassins who fought together in many world conflicts, but had grown apart as their allegiances had been pulled towards warring clans of ninjas. Creed joined the Quay Strikers, who experimented on their warriors to enhance them, they used their enhanced powers to take on high-paying work for whatever shady world leader or wealthy arms dealer needed work done by the ninjas. Logan trained with the Shirai X, a group that had started as a splinter faction of the Quay Strikers that wanted to use their abilities for less chaotic purposes. They trained in their own variation of the fighting style of the Quay Strikers, and they wore outfits that were like a different colored version of the Quay. This only served to further infuriate the original clan, who despised this new group that they considered traitors. But Logan only occasionally fought for the Shirai X. He focused much of his time on his family that he'd started. He was happy living a largely domestic life. That is, until the Quay Strikers, and specifically his half-brother, finally caught up with him. A group of ninjas led by Creed went to the Hasashi home and killed Logan's family. In a berserker rage, Logan tried to retaliate and kill his brother, after laying waste to all the other ninjas that had been brought, but Creed was far too powerful now. He'd been enhanced more and more, becoming a powerful cryomancing warrior, now called Sub Saber, an animalistic brute with the ability to shoot and control ice. Creed nearly killed his brother, but Logan's innate healing abilities kept him barely alive as Creed brought him back to the Quay Strikers. They experimented on him against his will, hoping to enhance him, then brainwash him to fight for them again. They succeeded in enhancing him, forging unbreakable chain claws into his arms, but before they could attempt the brainwashing, he escaped and was now even more capable of hunting down all the members of the Quay Strikers. Months later, after Logan had cut through waves of the Quay Striker ninjas looking for his treacherous half-brother, Creed would hear of the Marvel Combat Tournament and enter, hoping that Logan would do the same. Creed thought that some of the otherworldly warriors in the tournament could potentially weaken or even kill Logan before the two of them could come up against each other. Logan would enter and survive to face his half-brother, not being remotely weakened by the previous fights, and he'd finally get his revenge, killing the man who'd taken his family from him. But Logan Hasashi's fight wasn't over, as the Quay Strikers were still out there, and worse still, Creed wouldn't be the last person to take on the mantle of the Sub Saber.
Five tournaments went by and five victories were taken by Thao Kanos. He was only one away from winning the final gem and being granted the right to take over Earthrealm, and its mightiest protector was still wallowing in his mortality. But soon his attention would be caught by a group that had gathered to train together, planning to all enter the tournament. They hoped by preparing as a group, one of them could finally become strong enough to defeat Kanos' forces and avenge those who'd fallen in combat thus far. This was a powerful group of fighters of various strengths, who Thoradin actually found some semblance of hope in. Even in his weakened state, he came to them, told them his history, and said he'd train them. His body may have been weakened, but he still had a warrior's mind. They trained hard and all the fighters soon had what seemed like a fair shot at finally winning the tournament and saving Earthrealm. In fact, their training caught the attention of Shinoki, who told Kanos of the powerful group. Thao Kanos wasn't concerned, but for the first time he decided to enter the tournament himself to ensure victory, and hoping to once more embarrass Thoraiden by defeating his warriors. Thoradin had faith in his budding team, but knew that Earthrealm needed every asset they had. He decided to enter the tournament himself once more. Without his godly power, he was likely to be killed, but decided that if he could give Earthrealm even one win, it would be worth it. The Eternal Gods took notice of this selfless act, and decided that if Earthrealm won and Thoradin lived, they'd grant him back his mighty staff and all his powers along with it. With the stakes further raised, the sixth Marvel Combat Tournament began. Earth's forces fought well, winning many rounds, but slowly as they picked off Thaukanos' forces, so did he wear away at theirs. Thoraiden lived through his fights, but he was defeated eventually. The final fight came down to a battle that no one had anticipated, the mighty overlord Thaukanos himself against Earthrealm's own Lu Shang. Shang was a master of kung fu and could control fire to create flaming clones of himself. He'd been raised from birth as a fighter and was highly skilled, but he was hardly considered to be the most powerful warrior Earthrealm had to offer. Thoradin and his allies watched with extreme unease as the final battle began. Kanos started the battle by toying with his foe, not taking the warrior seriously in the slightest. But as Shang landed blow after blow, Kanos started slowly realizing that he should have been going all out from the start. His own arrogance would be his downfall this day. Liu Shang with his flying kicks and flaming clones and a final blow from a mighty fire dragon that he spawned with his power, finally managed to do what so many generations had failed to do. He defeated Thao Kanos, and Earthrealm was saved. Kanos was outraged, but had to accept defeat. The gems he'd won were taken from him, and were once more made prizes for future tournament victories. One stone was given to Earthrealm, and Thoradin was once more granted his godly power. And while this was an incredible victory for Earthrealm, their troubles weren't over. They'd still have to continue fighting in Marvel Combat tournaments to hold back Kanos' forces, so that he couldn't invade them in the future. This meant that it was time to start training the next generation of fighters. Luckily, some of the mightiest heroes had children over the next few years, children who were just as eager to fight for their home realm in the tournaments. One of these was Kate Cage. She was the daughter of two heroes who fought against Kanos' forces before, Clint Cage, an Olympian-level archer turned Hollywood actor, and Natasha Blade, an ex-KGB assassin turned founding member of the SOIA, or the Strategic Outworld Investigation Agency. They adopted and raised Kate to be an ultimate fighting machine, as skilled at hand-to-hand -hand combat as her mother, and as good an archer as her old man. As Kate was trained by her parents, she was then able to help train and lead other aspiring Earthrealm heroes. Kate would go on to win the next tournament, despite near impossible odds to prove that Earthrealm would never accept another loss to Kanos' forces. She'd help solidify the message made by those heroes before her, that Earthrealm was now home to the mightiest heroes that would ever participate in Marvel Combat.
Well, I hope I did justice to the Mortal Kombat lore for all you massive Mortal Kombat fans out there. Not gonna lie, this was a pretty tricky episode to write. Some of the fusions felt pretty obvious, but some of them were really difficult to decide on. Anyway, if you're new to the channel, I got tons of other episodes like this. I recently did an episode turning video game genres into people, and I worked some Mortal Kombat elements into the fighting game character in that. And I've got tons of other Marvel episodes, got a whole playlist full of them, fusing them with DC characters, turning them into dragons, whole bunch of stuff. And based on the awesome reaction that people had to the last SCP Superheroes episode that I did on Monday, I'm currently working on a sequel to that to come out this next Monday. So get excited for that. But besides that, that's all for today. I'm Christian Pearson. This has been Popcross Studios, home of the Nerdy Start videos on YouTube. Thank you so much for watching, everybody, and I will see you all, hopefully in the next episode, on Monday. Goodbye.